One of my favorite stories in the Pali Canon is when King Basenity and his queen, Malika, were alone in, their, in the bedroom. And at one point he turns to her and says, Is there anyone in the world you love more than yourself? And of course, being a king, he's expecting her to say, Yes, Your Majesty, I love you more than myself. Now, if that were a Hollywood movie, that's probably what she would have said. But this is the Pali Canon. And she says, No. How about you? Is there anybody you love more than yourself? And the king has to admit that there's nobody he loves more than himself. So that's the end of that scene. The king leaves the, the palace and goes down to see the Buddha and reports the conversation. And the Buddha affirms what Queen Malika said. You could search the entire world and there's nobody you could find that you love more than yourself. Now you could take that realization in lots of different directions, but the Buddha takes it in a, a really wise one, which is that as a result of this, you should never harm anybody or cause them to do harm. In other words, you should love yourself intelligently. And John Sawat would make this point many times. There's a phrase in Thailand, looking after yourself is the Thai way of saying being selfish. But he says, it doesn't have to mean being selfish. You look after yourself intelligently. Behave in a way that you make yourself deserving of your self-esteem. And that's what practice in generosity, the practice in virtue, and the practice in develop, developing the mind are all about. Looking for happiness in a way that you can take pride in. I received a strange letter from a young guy the other day saying that he saw the big flaw in this approach to the practice, which is that you could develop pride. Well, there's healthy pride and there's unhealthy pride. Healthy pride comes from seeing that your actions are blameless. It doesn't have to come from comparing yourself to someone else. That's the kind of pride that the Buddha saw, said was unhealthy. You start comparing yourself to other people and the goodness of your actions and the goodness of your meditation just disappear. But if you look at yourself and you see that you're getting better in the practice, okay, that's a healthy pride, healthy self-esteem. That's the kind of thing the Buddha encourages when he was teaching Rahula. He said, if you look at your actions and see that you didn't harm yourself or didn't harm anybody else, take joy in that fact and then continue training. Because a lack of self-esteem doesn't come from the fact of not loving oneself. It comes from loving yourself, but then seeing you're having the sense that you're not deserving of that love. And so you want to make yourself deserving of it. You're not automatically deserving. We talked about it this afternoon, that tapestry where someone attributes to the Buddha the idea you could search the world and find no one who's more deserving of love than yourself, which is not what he said. To be deserving of your love, you have to act in a way that's deserving of that self-esteem, deserving of that self-respect. This is why the Buddha places generosity right at the beginning of the path. You find happiness in helping others, either with material goods or with your time or with your energy your knowledge, your forgiveness. Because when you're able to be generous in these ways, there's a sense of wealth that comes with that, that you have more than enough. You're not constantly scrounging around and worried about things running out. You realize that you have more than enough energy to give. And the funny thing is, as you give that energy, you find that more energy comes. The same with the precepts. When you follow the precepts, you find that you can look at your behavior and there's nothing you can criticize about it. And there's a sense of well-being, a sense of self-esteem that comes from that. You look at the world around you and you see all kinds of behavior and you realize you don't have to give in to those standards. You have your own higher standards. And there may be a little bit of comparing yourself with others in that thought. 
but what it comes down to is that you realize that your goodness doesn't have to depend on other people's goodness. There was a debate recently over the question of whether there are times when it's justified to go out and kill people if they're really evil. Well, it's making your goodness depend on their goodness or badness. It's not something of an independent value. It's not an independent principle. But as the Buddha pointed out, your goodness has to be generated from within. It comes from your wisdom, seeing that regardless of how bad other people are, you're not going to behave in that way. And that gives rise to a sense of self-esteem. So the self-esteem that they're trying to teach our kids simply by the fact of existing, you have self-esteem. That doesn't really work. Self-esteem comes from the fact that you love yourself and you want to behave in a way that you feel that it's you're worthy of that love. And this is why we have that reflection that we're the owners of our actions. Because that's basically what makes us. Our actions make us just as we make our actions. That reflection the Buddha has you make every evening. Days and nights fly past, fly past. What am I becoming as this happens? What you're becoming, of course, comes from your actions, from the habits that you're developing. So what kind of person are you creating through your actions, through your thoughts, through your words, through your deeds? You want it to be a good person, someone who really is deserving of your love. And that requires that you have an independent source of goodness inside. Goodness here in the sense of your worth as a person. And so this is one of the reasons why we train the mind in meditation. It's not just for relaxation, it's for gathering strength. On the one hand, as the mind gets more still, you see things in the mind a lot more clearly. You can understand when there's an unskillful impulse, you can see what it's coming from. When there's a skillful impulse, you can see that it's there as well. And then the second gift that comes from the meditation is the strength to let go of the unskillful one and to develop the skillful one. And to remember these things, what's skillful, what's not, and what you should do with these things. That's what mindfulness is all about. And why understanding mindfulness as a quality of memory, your, beginning, your ability to hold things in mind. Because you're constantly shaping your experience. This is the karma that the Buddha had you focus on most intently, is what you're doing right now. As for your past karma, that's going to come willy-nilly. But when it meets up with good karma in the present, sometimes past bad karma can be dissolved. The image the Buddha gives is of a big lump of salt. If you try to dissolve it in a little tiny cup of water, that water is going to be too salty to drink. If you dissolve it in a large river, assuming that the river is not polluted otherwise, you can drink the water. So you want to make your mind expansive. Make it into that river of water, which he defines on the one hand as a Expansive through the development of the Brahma Viharas, your goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, your equanimity. You want to make those large. As he says in another place, you make it large like the river Ganges, large like the element of space, large like the earth. Bigger than anything that's coming your way. And then secondly, you want to have a quality that he calls being developed in body and developed in mind. Developed in body means that Pleasures can come, and your mind isn't overwhelmed by them. Developed in mind means that pains can come, and your mind is not overwhelmed by them. In other words, your mind is larger than these things. So your experience of what your past karma is going to be is very much dependent on the quality of your mind right now. This is the aspect of karma that the Buddha wants you to focus on. As for where your past karma is coming from, and all the details of what you're experiencing right now, where they came from, he says those are inconceivable. They're just too complex to want to tease out, and it's not worth it. 
what's worth it is realizing that by creating a good state of mind right now, you're getting more and more in charge of what you're experiencing. And as long as you're a human being living, you're going to be creating karma. So do it well. And in creating the karma, you're creating yourself. Of course, ultimately we want to create the kind of karma that goes beyond having to be ourself, beyond having to experiencing these things. There is a dimension that lies beyond all this, and it's only through our efforts that we can arrive there. We're not creating it. This was another issue that was raised in that letter, the idea that if you're working on your path and you've got the, the wrong assumption that somehow you can create the unconditioned. And that's not the case at all. And John Lee's images of salt water, there's fresh water in the salt water. But just relaxing and letting the water sit there is not going to get this fresh water out of the salt water. You've got to distill it. The effort we put into acting and skillfully with our thoughts, words, and deeds, that's the, the heat of the distilling. And that's what gets the salt away. So we can see all oh, the fresh water has been here all along. And when you found out, that's when you've done the best thing you can for yourself and for other people. It's a false dichotomy to think that by finding awakening for ourselves we're just narrow and not concerned about other people. I mean, the fact that there are people working for enlightenment in the world, working for awakening in the world, that's what gives hope to humanity. Otherwise we'd just be grubbing around, grabbing this, grabbing that, and as in the Buddha's image fish fighting over water in a, in a puddle that's shrinking all the time. That's what the world is like if you're not trying to make yourself worthy of your self-love. So when you find people who are suffering from self-hatred, it's not so much that they don't really love themselves. They love themselves, but there's a conflict. They're disappointed in themselves. And the Buddha's right. If you just go looking for your immediate pleasures without any concern about the consequences, there's very little to respect. And it gets very dismaying looking at the world that way. But if you decide you want to love yourself intelligently, wisely, in other words, behave in a way that's worthy of your self-love, you find that it's a gift not only to yourself, but a gift to the people around you. And it's a gift whose effects just keep rippling out. So realizing that you love yourself more than anybody else, act in a way that's in line with intelligent self-love, wise self-love, wanting your best for yourself. And that means wanting the best for all your thoughts, words, and deeds. That's why this teaching on self-love is so tied up in the teaching on karma, because it's through your actions that you create yourself. And so it's going to be through your actions that you can create a self that's worthy of your love, and that can take you beyond yourself. <laughs>